প্রভু কথা মৃত তপ্ত জীবন কবি ভীত কলমশাপ তব কথা মৃত তপ্ত জীবন কবি ভীত Do you all know the seminar? What's the topic for the seminar? Okay, Kamlesh Krishna came to the secret. <laughs> the topic will be Krishna's pastimes are out of Vrindavan. Which means Krishna is, after Krishna left Vrindavan, he went to Mathura, then he went to Dwaraka, and so we will discuss those past times mainly, but just we'll do a recap of Krishna's Vrindavan past times also. That's what we'll do today. And the next few days we'll discuss about Krishna's past <coughs> out of Vrindavan. And since it's all Krishna's past times, so we will begin the class with Tavakatha. Do you understand the meaning of this song? Tava Kathamritam. Tava means who is Tava? Tava means here. Yeah. Who is Krishna? Kathamritam. Katha means narrations or instructions. Instructions by Krishna in Bhagavad Gita and, ins- and narrations about Krishna's pastimes. <clears throat> they are known as Katha and Amritam because they are Nectarian. They are Amritam. Tapta Jivanam. Jivan means life. And Tapta means very hot. Burning. How is our existence in the material nature? Very beautiful, very wonderful, <laughs> full of promises, full of excitement, full of opportunities. But that is the illusory influence of the world, illusory potency. We are suffering, but we consider the suffering condition to be joyful. The reality is this material existence is full of suffering. And the thing is, the more we try to enjoy, the more we end up suffering. Therefore, saintly people in the past, they used to voluntarily accept austerities, difficulties. Because this... See, suffering, enjoyment leads to suffering. So now you reverse the process. A voluntary acceptance of suffering will lead to enjoyment. (coughs) But that is not actually the cure for the suffering condition. The suffering conditions are threefold. You all know that, I'm sure. There's no need to elaborate on that. What are the threefold miseries? Very good. Adi Atmik, Adi Daivik, and Adi The suffering caused by body and mind, they are known as Adi Atmik. The suffering caused by other living entities, that is caused, that is called Adi Bhautik. And the suffering caused by the demigods, or Sufferings due to natural calamities. Now, can anybody avoid these threefold miseries? And the life itself is full of suffering. It's all designed for suffering. Janma, Mrittu, Jala, Bhati. Dukkha, Doshanu, Darshanu. These are the Dukkha. Dukkha means 
suffering. <coughs> Sorrows. So this is the material way of life, materialistic way of life. We are suffering, but we are actually thinking that we will enjoy it. And little bit of enjoyment that comes, it's only a, a transient thing. We get some enjoy, so-called enjoyment that comes out of sense gratification. When our senses are gratified, when our mind is, <coughs> the mind's desires are fulfilled, we call it enjoyment. But the actual condition is a miserable suffering. So that stop the jiva. Now, don't you also sing every morning? Samsada dava nalavita loka. This material nature is like a forest fire. We are burning in a forest fire. Samsada dava nalavita. Generally, we don't really understand this suffering condition. We don't understand what the reality is. Until and unless you become a persistent person. A person who is situated in knowledge, he actually gives us the real understanding. He, he makes us aware. Uh, see, simple considerations. Uh, a saintly person makes us aware how we are designed to suffer. How we are meant to suffer. Therefore, we must try to get out of this situation. <coughs> Not only th this material nature is a place of suffering, our bodies are actually a wonderful instrument to receive pain. Take any part of your body. <coughs> Just take any insignificant part of your body that you don't even think of, like your ear lobes. <laughs> Considering how many ways you can inflict pain to this ear. <coughs> Take a knife, cut it. Take a needle, pierce it. Take fire, burn it. So many ways. Now you're considering how many ways you can give pleasure to your ear. Can you think of any? Now that actually applies to every single part of our body. Every single part of our body. What does it indicate? That this body is actually meant to receive pain. So we have to become aware of this reality. So Tapta Jiva now, our life is actually like constantly burning in a forest fire. <clears throat> and this Krishna Katha comes in as a shower of nectar. When there is a forest fire, what can extinguish that forest fire? Nothing besides torrents of rain. But not only, no, it's not only a torrents of rain, it's a torrents of nectar. A shower of nectar. Not only extinguishes our miserable condition, but it gives us life of immortality. Life of full of joy. This is what Krishna Gautha is. Tava katham vitam, tapta jivanam, kobibhivi Who actually broadcasts this message? Does any Tom, Dick and Harry speak about it? No. <laughs> those who are situated in transcendental yeah. knowledge. Those who are situated in, uh, in pure devotional yeah. service. Those who are intimately related to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. <clears throat> 
and call Mashaba home. It frees us from all our sinful reaction. Apohanam, as if Apohanam means stealing away. As if this Krishna Katha steals away all the sins from our life. Steals away Apohanam. Or it also can mean destroys. Hanan means to kill. So all the sins are killed by Krishna Katha. Kalma Shapaham, Shavana Mangalam. And when we hear Mangalam, it brings all auspicious. Shri Madhatatam and bestows the transcendental wealth. Everyone is running after mundane wealth, material wealth, money. Everyone is running. But compared to this wealth, money becomes a <coughs> dirt. So this is how opulent this Krishna Katha is. Kalma Shapaham Shavana Mangalam Srimadatatam and Bhubi Grinanti, those who distribute this, this Krishna Katha all over the world, Bhuri Dajana, they are the most munificent personalities. Bhuri Dajana. <coughs> So, this is how important it is to listen to this Krishna Katha. And that's why I thought we'll start the class every day with this song as a reminder why we are here. Are we here to just have an excursion and a good time? Huh? A nice island, a Croatia, beautiful weather. <laughs> Far from Hellish England. <laughs> no, we are not here for that. Of course, we try to make it in a setup which is nice and pleasing. But our main objective is to get absorbed in Krishna Gata. <clears throat> Somehow something happened to my voice today and all of a sudden <clears throat> it was all right. Start off with our prayers to Srila Prabhupada. Oh, you have something? Let's see if it works. Oh, fisherman strike. <laughs> <laughs> My immediate reaction was fishermen are our enemies. <laughs> Namaste. 
What is the essential teachings of Bhagavad Gita? <clears throat> the essential teaching of Bhagavad Gita is we are not this body, but we are spirit soul. Our actual identity is spiritual. Arjun was reluctant to fight, thinking, how can I kill my relatives and friends? So Arjun is lamenting. The first chapter is known as Vishal Yoga. Arjun's lamentation. But what Krishna is pointing out to Arjun, Arjun, what are you lamenting for? To begin with, his body is transient. The body is going to change. It's born, it lives for a while, and then the body is going to die. So why lament for something that is perishable? And then he explains what is the real identity. The real identity of a living entity is the soul. And the soul is indestructible. Soul is immortal. Soul is eternal. Soul doesn't die. The soul will soul is never born, the soul will never. And then gradually Krishna is establishing his identity as the Supreme Personality of God. It's quite interesting, like Krishna's, Arjun's relationship with Krishna is like cousins. They're two brothers, cousin brothers. Arjun's mother and Krishna's father are brother and sister. So they're cousins. And they are of the same age, so therefore they are very close friends, intimate friends. And then, <clears throat> all of a sudden Krishna starts to tell him, I know Ar Arjun, I gave this knowledge first to Vivashwam. And then Vivashwam <coughs> gave it to Manu, Manu gave it to Ikshaku. In this way, in this succession, this knowledge has been flowing. And just try to imagine, all of a sudden your cousin tells you, <laughs> give some knowledge to the sun god who appeared zillions of years ago. So, so that was Arjun's question. Hey, Krishna, what's the matter? Aparam bhavato jangu param jangu vivashata. You were born just the other day and vivashata appeared so many years ago. How can I got from it? How can I understand that you gave this knowledge to Krishna? Then Krishna tells Arjun, Arjun, Bahuni men bhatitaan Many, many times you have taken births, so they die. But about those births, you don't remember anything, whereas I remember everything. So this is how Krishna is establishing the difference between Arjun and him. Ajivatma and him as the Supreme Personality of God. So that's the difference between us and Krishna. Many, many times we have taken birth, but about those births, do we remember anything? What to speak of birth? We don't even remember about yesterday. <laughs> In a way, <coughs> this is how the living entities have a very minute, very tiny memory. Whereas Krishna's memory is infallible. He doesn't forget anything. He remembers everything. So in this way, Krishna then established his identity. I think that Arjun, although I spoke about birth, many, many times you and I have taken birth, but I am unborn. Ajuhopi son of Bayatma, I am unborn. Yet I manifest myself. Again, there is a difference between us and Krishna. We come here being born in different bodies. Whereas Krishna comes in a self-same body. 
Atma Mayayam, which is internal potency. But the arrangement of his internal potency seems that Krishna has given birth, Krishna is going up from a child, and so forth. But no, that's not. It is actual identity. He is eternal, but he is manifesting himself. Jogamaya makes us believe or feel, oh Krishna has taken birth. Oh Krishna is like a baby, Krishna did this, Krishna did that. But Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Therefore, in a way, Krishna's pastimes can be compared to a drama. So you are acting in a drama. Now you become somebody. Right? And when the, those who are watching the drama, they see you like that. But are you really that? You are playing somebody's role. So similarly, Krishna acts his pastimes. And by doing that, he entertains his devotees. And he educates the innocent. These are the two purposes. And there is a third objective also, Krishna's pastime. And he agitates the demons. <coughs> but the moment they see Krishna or hear about Krishna, they get agitated. Because it, string, it rings the wrong chord. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Because the Supreme Personality of Godhead is established as the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Where the demons think that they are the Supreme. That's why they can't tolerate that someone else is superior Supreme. So they make their allies with those who try to become Supreme. Uh, because they all are just like sometimes uh, the thieves cooperate with each other to rob a bank. <laughs> so demons also get together with that objective. They become, they become, they make a kind of coalition. They make, they make a joint venture. And that venture makes them, brings them together as if they're friends, but they're not actually friends. And in Krishna's pastimes, we will see that. The demons become united with one objective, that is to stand up against the Supreme <coughs> Another thing that happens in the demons, we will see, like a bigger demon defeats the smaller demon and they become submissive to him. How did Kamsa become the leader? Because Kamsa defeated all the other demons. And those demons surrendered to Kamsa and they became Kamsa's allies. So this is how <coughs> the demons display their true nature when the Supreme Personality of God it comes to the scene. Otherwise, in a way, the demons seem to be very, very nice people. Turjanan was a nice person. I mean, hell of a nice person. <laughs> Otherwise, why so many people would follow him? Jarasandha was a very nice person, very pious person. Jarasandha also used to worship Narayan. Can you believe that? He was worshipping Narayan, but enemy of Krishna. Therefore, Chaitanya Charitamrita is saying that like Jarasandha and Shishupal, although they are worshipping Narayan, but do not accept Krishna, therefore they are demons. Now similarly, Chaitanya Charitamrita is pointing out, similarly, those who accept Krishna but doesn't accept Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, they are demons. <laughs> Knowing about Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, if they don't. Unknowingly somebody, that is innocent, that is not so bad. So we find that some people even, <clears throat> I mean, what to speak of Chaitanya, accepting Krishna but not Chaitanya Mahaprabhu becoming demon. 
some people, those who accepted Chaitanya Mahaprabhu but did not accept Nityananda, they have been rejected. Adhita Acharya's sons, few of his sons did not accept Nityananda, therefore Adhita Acharya rejected them. So, so these are the, the very, very intricate considerations. Like, we have to understand the Supreme Personality of Godhead with an open heart, with a submissive attitude. The saintly person is saying, therefore, you must accept. Don't depend upon your own perception, own judgment. Own intention. Depend upon the scriptures and the sadhus. Whatever the scriptures are saying, accept it. Nowadays, we, if, if we can see that this has become a fashion. And people are uh, saying, following so many people, practically bringing them up to the platform of the Supreme Personality. They are saying that he is God, but they don't accept the real God question. Rather, they frame him as God's competitor. Like in Bengal, that was a very common phenomenon. This Ramakrishna guy. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu appeared in Bengal, but they wouldn't accept Chaitanya Mahaprabhu as the Supreme Personality of God. They accepted Ramakrishna as the Supreme why? Because popular, he was popular. Uh, people said he is God, so okay, he is But according to Bhakti Siddhartha Saraswati Thakur's definition, uh, he was a uh, Murkha Pujari, illiterate Pujari. Uh, he was an illiterate. Murkha means uh, illiterate, ignorant, stupid. <laughs> so that is an Acharya's perception. And that's what we have to accept. An Acharya's perception. And Acharya doesn't just uh, speak like that from his own whims. Acharya's statements are based on scriptures. Whatever he says is why Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is the Supreme Personality of God? Yes, Krishna Varnam Dishak Krishna. Bhagavatam is declaring. Mahabharata is declaring. Subarna Varna Hemanga. Varanga Shandananga. Sannasak Krishna Shanta. Nishta Shanti But show me a single quote from the scripture about those idiots. <laughs> So that is the thing, that is, that is what Bhagavad Gita is teaching us. Not Bhagavad Gita is going to that extent. Bhagavad Gita is even criticizing demigod worship. Why are you worshipping these demigods? Why are you worshipping? Huh? These demigods are just subservience to Krishna. And they are order bearing servants. So recognize the CEO. Don't go to the clock. <laughs> and <clears throat> Krishna is clearly telling him. Jajanti Alpa Medha Saha. Alpa Medha Saha. Those who have very little intelligence, they worship the demigods. But purpose is even better than not worshiping anybody. <laughs> Worship the demigods is the proper understanding. That who are these demigods? Recognize that they are, the, they are subservient to Krishna. So, <clears throat> and when you recognize who actually they are, then there is no need to worship them. If you know the chairman of the company, will you go to the clerk to get your job done? When you have access to the chairman, why should you waste your time with the clerk? What to say to the sweeper of this company? 
So that is the real understanding that Krishna is giving in Bhagavad Gita and along with that Krishna is giving other instructions, karma yoga, act in a proper way. Act in such a way that you will become related to Krishna, you will become connected to Krishna. That is the purpose of karma. And then the karma, when this karma is, when the offer, the results of your actions are offered to Krishna, then it becomes real karma. And when you are acting only on behalf of Krishna without any consideration, that is bhakti That is shuddha bhakti. Anna bhilashika sunnam jnana karma. No other desire, no other fruity desires. No consideration of loss and profit. Just serving Krishna for the sake of our love for Krishna. Just for the sake of our love for Krishna. That's what we serve. When the mother serves the child, does the mother get any salary? Does the mother have any other intention? Does the mother think, okay, this child will grow up and he'll take care of me? Does the mother ever think that way? So why does the mother stay up the whole night and serve his, serve her little baby? Why? There's so many mothers here. Why? Because of your love. <clears throat> so when we serve Krishna for the sake of our love for him, that is called pure devotion to And that should be the goal of life. Developing our love for Krishna should be the goal of life. Prema Pumartha Mahan. Prema, Prem means love. Love for whom? Love can be, love is only for Krishna, not for anybody else. This is another consideration. Atmendriya priti bancha dharibuli kaam. Krishnendriya priti icha dharibuli The desire to gratify our senses is not love, it's lust. But that's going on in the name of love in this world. And that's the, that's the biggest uh, setback. That's the biggest problem in this world, that we do not know what real love is. A desire for sense gratification and whatever is gratifying our senses or gives the promise of our sense gratification, we are running after that and we call that love. But that's lust, calm. But Krishna we are pretty each other. The desire to give pleasure to Krishna's senses is love. Sometimes people get upset, why are you speaking like that? Love, so wonderful. <laughs> Do you totally want to disregard Romeo and Juliet? <laughs> well, and look at the end of it, that's the ultimate you have so many love stories, but all the love stories ultimately is a sad story. What happened to Romeo and Juliet? The biggest love ends up in massive heartache due to separation. The deeper this attraction for these material objects, Greater is the pain. Yes, Romeo and Juliet were in love for each other, head over heels. But look what happened. Romeo could not tolerate the separation from Juliet. And then when Juliet came back to life, or rather came back to her, regained her consciousness and found that Romeo is dead, killed her. So, 
That is the thing. All the love stories are the tragedies. All real love stories are tragedies. It's a partial comedy. Partial romance. <laughs> but the end part is Whereas with Krishna it is different. You develop your love for Krishna, then what happens? Huh? You know what, you lo what love for Krishna will lead, lead you to or award you? First thing is klesha me. Klesha means suffering. As I told you, this material nature is full of suffering. But love, as you develop your love for Krishna, the first effect of that love is no more suffering. All suffering gone. When you eat food, somebody has to tell you that now your hunger has subsided and your body is feeling strong. Uh, your stomach feels satisfied. Does anybody have to tell you? You yourself experience that. So these are the effects that one will experience as one develops his love for Krishna. Klesha Gni, Shuhada, it brings all auspiciousness. When you accept your relationship, loving relationship with Krishna, then all auspiciousness automatically comes. And this is just the beginning. And ultimately, what do you get? Ultimately, you get Endless joy. So, <clears throat> so that is what happens when we become <coughs> situated in the right situation. I mean, I can go on explaining this, you know, how proving it, why it happened. Anyway, I'll give you a very simple scientific understanding. The problem with this material, our material existence is that material life means life that is centered around the body. Material life means the life that is based on this body. And But we are spirit souls. Now we are trying to get what the soul wants through this body. Can it ever can it ever be fulfilled? Soul's needs or soul's achievements, or soul's natural achievements, cannot be achieved through this body. For example, does the soul ever die? <coughs> now when the soul considers that I am this body, what he tries to do? He wants to make this body immortal. But will this body ever be immortal? No. Soul is full of knowledge. Therefore, the soul wants the body to be full of knowledge. The soul is full of joy. Therefore, he wants to make this body full of joy. But, will it, but does it ever happen? This constant struggle to enjoy is actually the soul's desire to make this body joy. But the body will ne never become immortal, the body will never become full of knowledge, the body will never become full of joy. Therefore, what Krishna consciousness or Bhagavad Gita is teaching us, what Bhagavad Gita is teaching us? To shift our consciousness from the body to the soul. What you are hankering for is already there, you don't have to separately end it up. It's already there. Your soul is immortal. You are immortal. But the trouble is you're trying to make this body immortal. So recognize this body is not you. Recognize who you are. Then automatically you'll become immortal. You'll become full of knowledge. You'll become full of joy. And what is the process? Just become connected to Krishna. <clears throat> so 
simple example. A light bulb is there. Now it wants to be lit up. What does it have to do? Can the light bulb by itself become lit up? But if the light bulb somehow becomes connected to the electric source, then what? So that's what the reality is. That's what the secret is. We simply have to become connected to Krishna. And when we become connected to Krishna, then automatically what we are, we will be become So in this way, in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna is actually pointing out who, are you, who we actually are. How many of you think that your spirit soul is not the body? How many of you really think you are not this body? Very good. So we should know what happened to you. <laughs> so, <laughs> so <clears throat> this is how uh, Krishna, the first lesson in Bhagavad Gita, to recognize. Yeah, at least theoretically let us understand that. Practically you may not be realized. Yes, we do feel that. When you are hungry, we say, oh, I'm feeling so hungry. Who is feeling hungry? The body is feeling hungry. So that's happened. I'm so tired. I'm so sad. <laughs> but that's all on the body. But I am beyond all that. And it will happen. We simply have to follow the nature's course. You see, the na what is the nature's course? We are born. When you are born, what happened? The soul came in contact with this body. Isn't it? At that time, soul actually doesn't know how to handle this body. But then the soul's connection with the body keeps on getting more and more intense. And then at the prime of our youth, the soul and the body is in perfect harmony. But then we start to get old. Then what happens? When you get old, when you get old, the connection between the soul and the body begins to diminish. It keeps on diminishing and then it comes to a point at the time of death, the soul is free from the body of the body. So by nature's arrangement, we can actually become free from the body of the Simply have to grow gracefully. Yeah, when you are young, act like a young man. Use your body in the service of Krishna. But when you get old, you'll see that it's, you don't really have that much of stamina, that much of strength. Okay, grow gracefully. When you are old, become old. Why try to be young when you are old? <laughs> but that's what is happening. <laughs> And, and ultimately, nobody wants to die. Rather, let's grow in such a way that when death comes, we can say, what a relief. <laughs> <laughs> what a relief from this undesirable bondage. So that is how we have to... <coughs> we have to prepare ourselves. Nature is actually arranging that. So let us... Uh, go through our life and meet our end in a proper way. And the proper way means uh, remembering Krishna. The secret is that, that we cannot, there is a way we can try to free ourselves from the bondage of matter. It will be very difficult. The simplest way is to develop our attention to Krishna and naturally we will become detached. That 
Attachment to Krishna is so wonderful. The taste for being attached to Krishna is so wonderful that the attachment to matter becomes totally insignificant. When you have some stale bread, but you're hungry, then that stale bread, you know, rotting for the last 25 days, <laughs> will taste like nectar. Because you don't have anything else. But then somebody comes and brings a very nice cake from Bhaktivedanta Manor. <laughs> <laughs> will you be eating that rotten bread? What will happen? Throw it away. So that is what Krishna consciousness is. Because we don't have any other option, therefore we attach to this promises of material enjoyment. But when we get Krishna consciousness and we find how wonderful it is, then this material endeavor for enjoyment becomes totally insignificant. So much so that one feels like spitting at those thoughts. As King Kulashekar did. How is it? Jamnachari. The thought of sex life makes my lips curl in disgust and speak like those thoughts. That's how wonderful Krishna culture <clears throat> And then gradually Krishna is leading us to Sarva Dharma and Parikthaja. And that is the first step to developing the loving relationship. The surrender to Krishna, you know how wonderful the surrender is? As Krishna is saying, Ma Sucha, don't worry. The surrender is something like a person. He is actually the son of a king, but he forgot his identity. And he is wandering around, suffering so much. Then someday he gets to know that his father is the king. And then he goes back to the father and begs forgiveness from him for rejecting him and going away from him. And falling at his feet, he says, please forgive me. I'm now surrendering myself unto you. Then what will the father do? Hmm? When the father just picking up in his loving embrace. And then what will happen from then onwards? A wonderful loving exchange between the father and the son. So that is what Krishna consciousness is leading us to. Surrendering unto Krishna, but then what? Krishna is saying, surrendering, surrender unto me, but after that, what? As Krishna is saying, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. At that time, Krishna picks him up. My son, why, why did you go away from me? Although you rejected me, although you left me, but I have been constantly thinking of you. I have been waiting for you to come back, and now I'm so happy that you came. So that is the result of my future. So, <clears throat> then from Bhagavad Gita, it takes us to Srimad Bhagavatam. Bhagavad Gita is Krishna speaking about himself and our relationship with him, about us. But Srimad Bhagavatam is speaking about Krishna, who Krishna is. In Bhagavad Gita, Krishna is hesitating to speak about himself. 
Oh, how much can I blow my own trumpet? <laughs> <laughs> but Shrimad Bhagavatam, the devotees are speaking about Krishna. Therefore, there is no limit to their glorification. <laughs> <clears throat> but at the same time, Bhagavatam is describing who Krishna is in relation to first is Sarga creation. This world that we are in, what is this world? How this world has been created? Bhagavatam is giving a very clear understanding. This understanding has two aspects of it. One is in order to create this world, create this universe, Krishna lie down in the cause of ocean. He lay in the cause of ocean. And as he is breathing, his breathing is causing the bubbles to generate. And each bubble is an universe. Now again, let me also go back. Why did Krishna create this? In that respect, we can consider two ways. We can have, we can consider one is prison house where the criminals are being corrected. Now, prison houses are actually reform houses meant for correcting our perverted mentality. So, our mentality has become perverted. So, there is a need to create this prison house. So, Krishna is creating. where the criminals are being punished to eventually understand what, what they should do. Now, <clears throat> we can, uh, sometimes, some people find this quite shocking. Prison house, this material nature. Uh, I'm a prisoner, <laughs> what's wrong with you? <laughs> I think I'm the most decent and honest person. <laughs> anyway, so if we have some reservation or, uh, or uh, uh, reluctance in accepting that concept, then let's consider there's another consideration. The child wants to play with his friends yeah. in the park. So the child says, Daddy, Daddy, I want to go to the park. The father says, okay, come. So takes the child to the park. And coming to the park, the child is completely lost in his games with his friends. In the game, when he is winning, he is happy. When he is losing, he is sad. And that's the game. And he completely forgot about the father. But the child is playing on the, in the park. The father is sitting there on, the, on a bench next to the park and watching the child. And then the child is afraid, all the friends have left, it became dark, it became dark. So he calls her daddy, daddy, where are you? So then the father comes, picks him up and says, come, let's go. <coughs> so in a way our situation is like that. We are a bunch of kids who wanted to play and coming to the field meeting our friends, <laughs> we are completely lost. And in course of our game, some are, are our friends and some are our enemies. Those who are playing in my favor, they are my friends. Those who are opposing me, they are my enemies. And in this way, in this field, we are creating 
And we are so lost that we have no time to think about the Father. But then at some point when we turn to the Father and say, Daddy, Daddy, where are you? Then he comes and picks us up and says, come let's go. So that's why in order to create either the prison house or a playing ground, uh, Krishna created this material nature. And in this material nature, <clears throat> Krishna just uh, uh, made the arrangement simply by glancing towards the material nature. Material nature, or you can say matter, in <coughs> can matter be active by itself? For example, this harmonium. Can this harmonium, although it has the ability to play, mm -hmm. can it become, can it start playing by itself? <clears throat> so the point is, matter by itself cannot become active. Matter needs the spiritual touch. And the spiritual touch in this material nature is Krishna's glance, Mahavishnu's glance. And it is through the glance that living entities have come to the material nature. We all have come here due to this glance, through this glance. And in this material nature, we develop different types of material bodies. And that's how we became active in this material nature. And <clears throat> then, other factors began. This material nature is triguna mai. The material nature inherently has three modes goodness, passion, and goodness. And Krishna's glance also manifests in the form of time. So these two factors are very important. Time. Time, uh, that actually reminds me. How many of you read A.G. Wells' Time Machine? What is the fourth dimension that he's talking about? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, anyway. Uh, we know of three dimensions. Uh, any substance has three dimensions. Length, breadth, and height. These are three dimensions. Matter, solid matter, has three dimensions. Now, A.G. Wells actually very smart, I would say, and I think he got it from the Vedas. <laughs> he is saying that actually the time is the fourth dimension. Because everything existing, everything is existing on isn't it? This body is existing in time. This is existing in time. It appeared in time, in certain time. It lasts for some time, and then it dissolves or annihilates. So time is the most important factor. And the time is the glance. It's an expansion of Shankarsha. So, uh, so in this way, and that another factor that is there is the demigods. And the demigods are the witnesses and the giver of all the gods. In the material, we come to the material nature and we become active in the material nature. The demigods are watching all our actions and accordingly they are giving us the reactions. Karmana, Daiva Netrena, Jantar Karmana, activities. Being watched by Daiva Netrena, divine eyes. Who are those eyes that are watching us constantly? 
demigods. And accordingly, we are getting our body, and through this body, we are getting our reaction of past action. So see how in this material nature, every living entity is tied up with this principle of action and modes of material. Prakriti kriyomanani in this material nature, kriyomanani. Everything is active, everything is functioning. Guna and karma. Prakriti kriyamanani gunai karmani sarvata. Gunas, the three modes of material nature, and karma, our action. What's happening, we are actually, ultimately, we are like a bunch of puppets. Like a bunch of puppets. Does, does a puppet has its ability to dance? The puppeteer is making it dance. And the puppeteer is pulling the hands and the limbs of the puppet to the strings. So here, uh, the strings are the modes of material nature. We are acting and as a result of that, the reactions are taking place in the modes. We are acting in different modes and as a result of that the reaction will take place and the string goes up and we are functioning. It's such an interesting consideration actually. Ultimately we are simply puppets but one factor is there, our free will. That ordinary puppets do Like we are actually functioning According to Prakriti Kriyamanani Gunai Karmani Sarvata. But Ahankara Vimhuratma Karta Mutimanate. Being bewildered by his false ego, one thinks that he is the doer. So Krishna is pointing out here that whatever is happening to you is due to your guna and karma. But you have the intelligence and independence to decide what you are going to do. The first consideration, recognize which action will lead to what kind of reaction. Action in a mode of goodness will lead to happiness. Action in the mode of passion will lead to suffering. And action in the mode of ignorance will lead to illusion. Therefore, try to act in the mode of goodness. Don't act in the mode of ignorance because it will plunge into it, plunge you into ignorance. So why stay in ignorance like an animal? Doesn't really know what is happening to you. No consideration at all. An animal or a tree. No consciousness. But you are not an inert entity, you are a conscious being. But with your consciousness, when you try to enjoy the material nature, rest assured that you are going to end up suffering. Don't try to exploit this material nature for your enjoyment. Because it will lead to suffering. Do you want to suffer? No. Therefore don't. So act in a moment. Urdham gachanti shaptastha. Being situated in a mode of goodness, you will become elevated to the higher situation. Madhye tishthati rahis. Those who are in the mode of passion, they will stay in the middle. Jaghanna guna prittishtha adho gachanti tamasha. Being affected by disgusting attitude, they go down in the mode of ignorance. So first consideration is understanding which action will lead to what kind of reaction or not. So now you try to transcend that. 
Amen. Because in the mode of goodness also, you are still in the prison house. A prisoner may think, oh, if I become a first class prisoner, it will be wonderful. But you are still in the prison. Then the consideration is, how can I get out of the prison? Yes, you can get out of the prison also in two ways. Dig a tunnel out of it. <laughs> and escape. But you won't be out of the prison. You won't be free from your suffering condition. The police will be right behind you. And he'll be hiding all the time in constant anxiety. So that's not the way. What is the way? Recognize your mistake. What is the mistake? You have disregarded the Lord. You have a father who owns everything, who is controlling everything. And he is waiting for you to come back to him. So recognize him and surrender him. And then what will be the reward? After to begin with, you are the son of the king. So when you get out of the prison, where will you end up? Won't the father say, come and come back to my palace? So that is the reward for surrendering to Krishna. Therefore, the first consideration in Srimad Bhagavatam is the creation, sub-creation, getting different, different types of bodies and so forth in this material nature. Then the planetary systems. Then, the situations of different demigods, Manvantar, Ishanukatha, the glorification, the description of the activities of the world. Then, Nirodha, cessation of material existence, liberation from material bondage, and Ashraya, a shelter. Systematically, Bhagavatam is taking, up, taking us from step by step to the highest point, which is, as I mentioned, from the prison house to the palace of the king, becoming the prince or princess. So, this is how so wonderfully Krishna has made the arrangement through his Krishna Katha. And his devotees have further enhanced it through their wonderful reactions. Gold Premanande. Does anybody have any question? Yeah, he's talking about Chaitanya Mahaprabhu very, very nice way. Yeah. But then he is saying, worship Kali. <laughs> Did he say worship Chaitanya Mahaprabhu? He was, um, I mean, this is just my understanding. Pretty flawed, I'm sure. But um, yeah, he was devoted to Kali. He called her his mother. And, um, um, <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, when you mention the Prabhupada for the first time, Prabhupada asked me to translate his books into my mouth. And then he started to blast Ramakrishna <laughs> and Vivekananda. 
because Prabhupada could make out, he knew my heart actually, that I was a follower of Ramakrishna. <laughs> 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 I tell you that way. Every Bengali is a follower of Ramakrishna and Vivekananda, in a way. And every Indian is so affected by Ramakrishna and Vivekananda. Not so much Ramakrishna but Vivekananda. Narendra Modi. Huh? I see most of his interviews say the past of Vivekananda the next thing. Mm-hmm. Anyway, unfortunately they didn't come, in, come across Srila Prabhupada. And probably if I didn't come across Srila Prabhupada, then I would have been a follower of Ramakrishna. <laughs> but that way, like I could, I had to tell you frankly, I had a lot of respect for Vivekananda. Because I was thinking that he was brilliant. But when I went to Ramakrishna mission, I was totally disappointed. Because I could see that those characters are really useless. Um, you, you made me feel a lot better now. <laughs> um, because I've been... Um, uh, I've read the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna. And the way he talks about Jaitanya Mahaprabhu and the love, and the references to our, um, you know, the Shrutis, or I don't know exact words, but you know, he refers back to our traditional... Well, traditional. Incidentally, I can tell you one thing. Ram, Ramakrishna's words are not recorded. And Ramakrishna's... Nobody actually took notes of his speeches. All that came afterwards through Mathura Babu. Rani Rashman is son in law And he took most of the things from Chaitanya Charita. That's, that's, that makes me feel a lot better. <laughs> <laughs> Good that you came up with this question. Yeah, feel free to ask, you know, like, you know, like that's why, you know, this session is. Excuse me. Hi, Krishna Maharaj. Thank you very much for the wonderful class. I was just asked by the devotee to ask this question to you. Um, the question is, how does one change the subtle body to a spiritual body? And she's referring to, like, the subtle body, the mind, intelligence. Very good. Whose question is that? Is it coming? Subtle body, my Oh, okay. And I was wondering whether it's being broadcast on the internet or not. Oh, okay. No? Maybe you can do that. I, I don't have the uh, uh, feasibility of connecting it to the internet, Maharaj. Because you need the modem. Well, you need a computer and a Wi-Fi. Okay. I can try and... Who so knows the technique? He knows the... Yeah. So let's broadcast it. Okay. I'll find out. And uh, who can... So this actually you can put it on Mr. Boshti. DCS Mr. Boshti. That it will be a present this time in the class and it will be broadcast. In my opinion. Are you familiar with that? I can just check with you. Uh, um, anyway, we'll see. <coughs> uh, a good question, very good question. Okay, to begin with, how many types of material bodies do we have? Eight. How many material bodies do we have? Do you have only one material body? Yeah. No. Huh? Very good. Now I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm talking about Prem all the time. <laughs> Thank you, Prem Shankar. So, uh, yeah. How many times do you say that? What are those two? Subtle body, gross body? Gross body? is this body, made of five gross elements. What are the five gross elements? How many of you know? Uh, Earth, water, fire, fire, air. And uh, this body is made of these five elements. (coughs) How many of you know that? Okay, very good. And there are... Are there some other material elements also? Huh? Who knows what are the other material elements? 
Very good. Mind, intelligence, and thoughts. So we have another body made of mind, intelligence, and thoughts. So first of all, do you accept that these are three subtle elements? Yes. Your mind is matter, yes. and uh, mind is matter. Intelligence is also matter. False ego is also matter. These are not just some concepts. <coughs> These are matter, but subtle matter. So we have another body also made of these three subtle elements. Do you have a mind? Do you have a mind? Do you have a body made of mind? Okay. Just you know to make that point clear, I'm going to give you the example. When at night you fall asleep, what happens to your this body? Inactive. Are you aware of it? No. This body becomes inactive. But then you dream. When you dream, does the dream take place with you being there, yes. right? So what kind of body does you do you have at that time? Very good. Mm -hmm. At the time of dream, we experience our subtle body. When you are awake, both the gross body and subtle body are alive, awake. When we dream, the gross body is asleep, but subtle body is awake. So in this way you can see that you have a, another body, subtle body. Okay. <clears throat> At the time of death, we give up our gross body. We leave our gross body. That you can see, right? The gross body is lying there. No consciousness, dead. But this. What happens to the subtle body? Does the subtle body die? No. The subtle body actually carries the soul to the next body. And you know what that subtle body without a gross body is called? Ghost. 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 The ghost. That is, uh, the beings with a subtle body, you have no gross body. And in that body, generally, the soul is carried to the next destination. It goes through some processing in Jamaraj's, <laughs> Jamaraj's laboratory. <laughs> and it gets a proper shape, and then it's placed in an appropriate way. So, <clears throat> this subtle body, you can see subtle body doesn't die. Gross body dies, but the subtle body doesn't die. So then, what happens to the subtle body? At the time of death, we are free from the gross body. But, how to become free from the subtle body? Do we need to become free from the subtle body to become free from? Material bondage? Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, subtle body doesn't die. How do we not free from the subtle body's bondage? So that is the question. <coughs> right? Okay, subtle body is composed of mind, intelligence and possible. The subtle body doesn't die, but subtle body can dissolve. So when the mind is constantly engaged in thinking about Krishna, then what happens to the mind? At that time, see, when the mind is constantly thinking about Krishna, is this material or spiritual? Spiritual. Very good. So in this way, by constantly thinking about Krishna, the mind becomes spiritual. 
So in this way, when one becomes constantly engaged in serving Krishna, then what happens? Dadami buddhi yogantam Tesham anahe Sae satata yuktanam Bhajatam priti purvakam Dadami buddhi yogantam Yena maam pajantite So intelligence, what is the Sanskrit word for intelligence? Buddhi So buddhi yogam so now the intelligence is spiritualized. And in this way, when one becomes engaged in serving Krishna, then what happens to his false ego? Jivir Sarupai Krishna Nitadras. So what happened to mind intelligence and false ego? Very good. So they became spiritualized. In the sense, the material as mind, material intelligence, material intelligence, false ego is gone. And the pure soul is existing in this body at that time. That stage is called Jivan Mukta stage or Swarup Siddhi. Swarup, Swarup means one's spiritual identity. One is situated in his spiritual identity, although in his material, apparently material body. So is the body material? According to Prabhupada's description, no. Just as iron in contact with fire becomes red hot, is it iron or fire? So this is how the one becomes free from the bondage of uh, subtle body. Iha jasya harer dasya in the service of Hari. Karmana manasa gira his activities through his body, his mind and speech are engaged in serving Krishna. Nikhila shabhi avasthasu jivan mukta under all circumstances, he is liberated. Okay? Okay, I spoke about Sarup Siddhi. Sarup Siddhi means perfection of one's spiritual identity. That means at that time, he is situated in a spiritual identity, but he is in his apparently material body. But then, he is transported to the spiritual world after death. Then that is called Vastu Siddhi. After death, the pure spirit soul goes back to the spiritual world. <coughs> yes, Yes, when the soul takes on a new body, it forgets about its past. So is that the action of Yoga Maya or Mahamaya? Soul, when, what, what's that? When the soul takes on a new body. Okay, okay. Yeah, in this material nature, whatever is happening is that in the term. Mahamaya. Thank you. Thank you. Hare Krishna Maharaj. The, uh, the big debates going on between the pro-life and pro-choice lobbies out in the world. Uh, just want to some guidance, uh, what the scriptures say, when does the soul associate with the body after it's been conceived, after a child's been conceived, when does the soul associate with that? When the sperm <coughs> impregnates the ovum in the womb of the mother. It is through the sperm that the soul enters into the mother's womb and impregnates the womb. That's the time it is called. The ovum develops into the body in the mother's womb. But the living factor, the soul, comes through the sperm.
Thank you very much, Guru Maharaj. I just thinking, I'm, I'm a bit confused. I saw in internet about last. Yeah, a tree. Ah, it's on the side tree, sorry. So I'm saying it's on the side tree. That when someone's died, the soul, and the subtle body could go for adjustment with Yamaras. And I saw that the subtle body go to hell, and then this subtle body is burned. Is that the punishment they have? How is that? And then they will get another birth. But how is the punishment for the subtle body in the in the in the hell planet? Okay. <laughs> okay. Sometimes do you see in a dream that you are burning? <laughs> or sometimes do you see in a dream that somebody is beating you up? <laughs> when you dream. <laughs> Do you feel that is real or you think it's a dream? Yes. So it takes place in the subtle plane. But the thing is the difference between a dream and that experience in Jamalaya <laughs> is that in a dream you wake up into this body and then the dream dissolves. But there you won't have this body. <laughs> You are stuck with a subtle body and there is nothing to wake up into. So whatever you go through, you go through that. So after this suffering, sorry, I'll ask you later on. Sorry. What happened? No, no, tell me. He had some question. So when a person dies, it's finished. Then the soul, the subtle body, the, the, the mind, intelligence, and false ego that carry on the, the soul and then becomes uh, a ghost. And then meet with my um, uh, Yamaras. And then that's the judgment time. Then the soul goes to the hell. And then, then the punishment is uh, fire. So my question is, how is the fire affects the soul? Is that, is that, is that, is that the fire? The fire affects the subtle body, or is, or is the soul suffering this punishment? Well, the fire is, is subtle fire. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a lot of it in the hell. <laughs> I don't know how it's that word, that's why. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, since he brought up the question, let's answer that. Uh, okay, so if you are dreaming that there is fire, now, is it possible that in that fire, in that dream, you feel that that fire is real? No. When you wake I, up, then it is not. But when you are dreaming, I feel, when I'm when I'm dreaming, I feel in shock. I, it, for me, it feels real. Okay, let's put it this. Way. Let's put it this way. That in a dream, you are seeing that there is a tiger. How do you feel? Well, I feel feel scared. Okay. <laughs> Similarly, when in a dream you feel you see fire you feel you are getting burned. <coughs> yeah, that's right. Uh -huh. And when you, especially when it, when it is in hell, it's real fire. <laughs> <laughs>
Okay, now I understand my house. That's good. <laughs> Thank you. Any other question? Okay. Yes. Yeah, sure. It's nothing to do with Ramakrishna. <laughs> when you surrender, do you surrender in a practical way, little by little by little, or does it happen in one big swing? It depends on what speed you want to go. <laughs> do you want to drive at the speed of 30 miles an hour or 75 miles an hour? Yeah, go 100 miles. <laughs> and the practicalities of that? The faster you go, the faster you reach. <laughs> <laughs> the faster means the more committed you are, more dedicated you are, quicker you handle it. But the thing is, our attitude is we don't worry about the time. We leave it up to Krishna. Because surrender means to depend upon Him. Whatever you want, Krishna will. Because I know, whatever you're doing with me is for my benefit. All right? But on your part, you must be fully committed, fully surrendered, fully enthusiastic. So it's an attitude of acceptance of mm -hmm. what comes? Attitude of acceptance? Acceptance of? Of whatever comes your way? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, with an accent, with an attitude of acceptance. On my part, in this respect, there, is a, there are two examples here. One example is like that of a monkey, and the other is that of a cat. You see, the baby monkey just holds on to the mother, and the mother jumps from one tree to, one tree to another. If the monkey, baby monkey lets his grip grow, go, then he will die. But it never happens. It just holds on to And the mother is jumping. And the baby is holding on to the mother. Right? So with that kind of intensity, we should depend upon Krishna. And the other is like a cat. The cat is taking the kitten, <coughs> biting onto the back of the neck of the kitten with the sharp teeth. When the cat grabs a mountain monkey or grabs a mouse, with this teeth that he holds that for the mouse, it is dead. But with the same teeth, at the same point, the cat is holding its baby. The baby is completely relaxed. My mother is taking me to safety. So that is the attitude of the good. Apparently, it may appear to be an extremely dangerous situation. I don't care, Krishna. I know you are there. Yes. Okay. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. As you know, the um, discussion was going about you know the time of death. I have one question. At the time of death, who actually comes to collect the soul, especially the devotees? For devotees? Well, uh, let us first consider what happens to non-devotees. <coughs> right. For non-devotees, uh, if they are sinful, then Jamadutas come. Take them to Jamadutas. If they are pious, then the chariot comes from heavenly planet to take them to the heavenly planet. But for devotees, generally Vishnu Dutas come. Or sometimes Krishna himself may come. Does he, Lord Yamaraj comes anytime or just Yamaraj? Well, even if Jamadutas come to a devotee and takes him to Jamaraj, Jamaraj will be so happy to meet him. <laughs> and the devotee also will be so delighted. <laughs> oh, Mahajan! Bansha <laughs> <laughs> And then what do you think Jamaraj will do? Jamaraj will embrace him and say, I'm so fortunate finally I got. The association of a devotee. 
So for a devotee, whether Jamaduta Stam or Vishnu Duta Stam, all Thank you. So we can end with a little kirtan. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama.
नमो विष्णु बदाय कृष्ण पृष्ठाय भूतले श्रीमते भक्ति वेदांत स्वामी नाम नमस्ते सरस्वती देवे जस्ट फ्यू पॉइंट्स Mind you, this is a seminar. This is an arrangement to enrich our selves with Krishna consciousness. So treat this session as classes. Please bring your notebook and pen. take notes why i'm saying it's important to take notes because i'm going to have an exams on the final day <laughs> <laughs> i heard some of you were proposing that out of this five days or six days you want to have one day break no no no, no. no. and i thought the break will be there <laughs> that will be the day of the final day is that the same how many of you like this idea how many of you don't like this idea <laughs> Okay. Whether you like it or not, <laughs> you have to sit for the exam. Mother, yeah. we don't mind the exams as long as the marks are not declared. <laughs> yeah, sure. Okay. Only those who have the first ten will be declared. Okay. Huh? And the others will individually be there. <laughs> okay, thank you, Hari Krishna. 